Thank you for joining us for today's Master Gardener talk. We're very lucky to have uh, Amal Jansen here to talk about uh, modern drip irrigation. Hopefully it's a topic many of you are interested in and that you will find the information here useful. And so I guess Pamela, if you'd like to start. Oh, sorry. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. We'll try and get to them at the end. Yes, indeed. All right, Ruby. Hi, everybody. My name is Pamela, and I am a master gardener for Santa Clara County. And I actually am also an ambassador for uh, Valley Water, um, which was some training that I decided to get involved in because I was interested in our watershed and water security and clean water issues and invasive species uh, remediation work along our creeks and stuff like that. Um, and uh, today I, I want to talk about modern drip irrigation, um, sort of what the gold standard is, um, but also um, this is the kind of drip irrigation that will qualify for the rebate that Valley Water has. So uh, before, before I advance my screen here a bit, I would love if you want to go in the chat while I sort of talk a little bit about Master Gardeners uh, for you to join the chat and tell me a little bit about what motivated you to log in today. I'm sure many people have uh, some good reasons for coming to join this afternoon. And I'll take a look at those while I introduce um, what Master Gardeners are. Master Gardeners are trained volunteers for the state of California, but the UC Extension. Um, and we operate our help desk, which maybe you've already helped or you know participated with, where you can send pictures and ask questions. Um, right now it is virtual only, but we used to have walk-in um, as well. Um, we send out an email uh, that will be going up tomorrow, actually, uh, a monthly email with gardening tips and news um, that's relevant for the season. We operate demonstration and research gardens. Um, you might have seen our parcel at Marshall Cottle Park if you've been uh, exploring some new parks since the pandemic. Um, and then in normal years, we also have other events like the spring garden market, fall garden market, and um, other events like that. Right now, we've been doing most of our talks online via Zoom uh, with the libraries, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be doing more in person soon, but for sure, I hope you've got yourself a nice drink and you can kick off your shoes because you're, you know, at home and we can talk about drip irrigation. Uh, here's our website, Master Gardener website, um, and you can contact our help desk right there and um, sign up for our tips and events um, on our website as well. So mgsantaclara.ucanr.edu. Okay, so I'm going to start um, with a just sort of recap um, the rebate for Santa Clara County from Valley Water, the amount for projects approved July 2nd, that's Friday or later, um, will be increasing. Um, you can get uh, $2 a square foot for replacing a lawn or a pool. Um, and uh, you can get up to $3,000 for a residential site for a number of uh, uh, updates to your property. And I'm going to talk about the four types of rebates there are. Um, the landscape conversion is for sure the one that people are talking about the most, but it's only one of four. Um, that's the one where you can get $2 per square foot to replace turf or a pool with low water plants and the inline drip that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, you can also get rebates for inline drip conversions. If you've been watering ornamental plants with overhead sprinklers, maybe you took out your lawn and uh, you've got other plants in there, but you've been utilizing the existing sprinklers to water. Um, there's rebate for irrigation equipment upgrades, so new technology to be more efficient, like smart controllers with Wi-Fi and that can talk to your cell phone. Um, rain sensors that will automatically turn off watering when enough rain has been detected. And leak detection that is way beyond what you would catch with your eyes. Um, and uh, that's an area that's just going to be growing. 
um, as a way that we can sort of uh, be mindful of our water use. And then the last one um, is rainwater capture, and that's capturing rain from gutters and rain barrels, cisterns, planting rain gardens, um, that kind of thing. Um, all of those things have lots of details on the Valley Water website. Um, so um, you can find out about the details um, for qualification. But the most important thing I really want you to know is that you actually have to submit a plan. This does not have to be a landscape architect plan. This could be literally, okay, maybe don't send them a napkin, but a back of napkin type plan um, that, um, uh, that you make for, um, for your project. Um, but you do need to receive uh, a notice to proceed that they have approved your project to qualify for rebates. If you purchase any equipment, um, even if you haven't installed it before you get that approval, it will not count. So um, the particular rebates that I'm talking about are strictly for uh, Santa Clara County, um, but elsewhere in the state, um, where you know uh, people are served elsewhere, there are state rebates, um, and there's a there's a state of California uh, website devoted to uh, the rebates um, that other people can qualify for. So um, inline drip is a requirement basically in all of them. Um, so rules. What is WUCOLS? It's the Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. Um, it is um, basically a bunch of data. It's a database of plants um, where we have we've given them different amounts of water and observed what will keep them alive and what will keep them thriving um, and identifying which kinds of plants, native and non-native, um, that um, can survive or thrive in our environment in a low water situation. Um, it is used by laypersons and professionals alike. I'm going to briefly uh, show you. If you just type in WUCOLS, that acronym, W-U-C-O-L-S, you are going to find it because so many people are Google searching this all the time. Um, feel free to do it at any old time you want to. Um, when you get right to their homepage, you're going to find a user manual and plant search instructions. I would absolutely read that. There's a lot of information about how they got the data and what to do with the data in there. And then the third link down is the searchable database. Um, and then here's a screenshot just of that. You do need to put in a city so it determines what your region is. Um, and then you can choose to search for more or less things to get a narrower list as you like. Um, there's, you know, I've just highlighted the very low and low, um, which are the plants that are preferred for uh, the, the Valley Water rebates and most of the state rebates. Um, you can search and narrow down by a plant type or leave it open. Um, and there's an explanation of what all of those are um, in the user manual portion of the website. Um, what you should know though, for those of you thinking about Valley Water rebates, is that the conversion rebates for Valley Water have an official list that is a subset of this list that have the estimated square foot coverage of plants um, that will be necessary for your plan. Um, but they do, there are plants that are listed in WUCOLs as uh, very low or low that may not qualify for the rebate. So you want to take a look at that subset of um, of plants if you're pursuing the rebate as well. You could either start there or you could, you know, narrow things down once you've done a little searching. And then let's talk about the basics, sort of easy ways to, to um, participate in water conservation outside. And for sure, outside water use is the, is the place where we think most of the waste is occurring. Um, so, we have Santa Clara clay. That's why this was the Valley of Hearts Delight um, and why we have uh, so much agriculture in our history. Our soil is actually pretty great for growing plants. Um, our clay soil holds more water. It's really slow to absorb the water, but it's also slow to release it, which is great for helping plants um, in uh, hot, hot, dry summers. Um, thrive. 
Um, but one of the things that we really, it's really important that we do then with our clay is our match the application rate of whatever type of watering we're doing, to the soil absorption rate. In this case, our clay is not going to absorb water any faster than one half gallon per hour. Think about that in a gallon of milk, like anything more than that. And that's where we've got our wasted water. So um, if you can apply water to the ground at the same rate of that soil, that the soil can absorb the water and no more, you can totally eliminate your wasted water. Like perfect, problem solved, right? Um, modern drip tubing comes in 0.4 gallons per hour and 0.6 gallon per hour dripper options. So it's really possible to get very close to perfection. Um, and if you don't exceed the soil's absorption rate, you can be watering for a long period and you'll still get all the water to the plants where the plants can use it, even a thirsty plant like an almond tree or a stone fruit tree um, without any water running off. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit, but let's talk about sort of the next principle of water conservation. And that is, we want to water deeply and infrequently. So um, there I've got sort of a healthy root system of a plant. Um, the roots go in all directions and they go deep. Um, we would like to provide water all the places that those roots exist. And we would like to encourage with our watering style, those roots to show up everywhere. Um, and if you look at the graph on the right hand side, it kind of shows you what happens when we put water into clay soil. Um, it's absorbing very slowly over 48 hours. It's only gone a couple feet into the ground. Um, everything above that, it's just going to run off somewhere. So if your plants are right in the middle of that zone and we can apply water very slowly, then we can get them perfectly attuned to the plants in the ground. Another big component is applying mulch. And here I have exposed the mulch um, from a uh, grid drip irrigation uh, situation. I pulled it back. I was doing some observation of the soil to see how wet or dry it was. And then you can see the mulch pulled back on the side, but it's about five to six inches high. Um, that's a tree, so we keep the mulch a foot away from the tree. Um, but um, that depth will protect um, the hoses. Um, from harmful UV rays so that your investment in drip irrigation will last for a decade or more. Um, but it's also the magic that keeps the roots of the plants cool and captures rainwater in the winter and makes sure that it, you know, gets a chance to soak in the ground. It's really a, 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 wonder, a wonder thing. It will also uh, help you uh, keep your weeds out of your garden. And that's really helpful because many of our weeds are water hogs and they will absolutely steal the water that uh, is put down in the ground first um, if they get a chance. All right, sprinklers. <laughs> sprinklers, you know, get a bad rap. Well, maybe for a good reason. Sprinklers are a major concern when trying to conserve water. And I was just explaining that our clay soil absorbs water at a rate of 0.5 gallons per hour. But sprinklers, if you can find any stats on them at all, and oftentimes you'll go into a store, you won't find anything, they're usually measured in gallons per minute, not gallons per hour. That gigantic gap is where the waste is the greatest. So. Um, misting sprinklers, is terrible. I mean, okay, yeah, you get to see rainbows, but if you can see rainbows in your sprinklers, then you've got a lot of misting going on, and that is going to increase the, the evapotranspiration of water, meaning it's going somewhere else but on your plants. Um, if you're keeping your grass, but you can upgrade your sprinklers to a rotary style sprinkler, that's the one on the right, um, that sort of sends off in little jets. It tries to reduce misting. There's also a pressure regulator in each sprinkler head um, that reduces the total volume and tries to bring it closer to um, what the soil can absorb. You can also run sprinklers, you know, late in the evening, early in the morning. You want to avoid any time where wind or sun will affect the water delivery. Um, currently, if you are a customer of San Jose Water, those are already the requirements. 
Um, so a great time to turn your sprinklers on is after 9 p.m. and between 4 and 6 a.m. Um, uh, where the, that tends to be the periods of time where the wind tends to be calmest and where you can still monitor what's going on. Um, and then you want to address the remaining gap. Rotary sprinklers will cut it back a lot, but it's still not going to be 0.5 gallons per hour because that's, that's just not going to happen. So um, you can sort of address the remaining gap between the application and absorption by running your sprinklers for a few minutes and then pausing for several cycles. Let the ground get a chance to catch up, soak up the water while still getting water to the deepest roots. So it might look something like this. Sprinklers on for four minutes off for an hour. Sprinklers on for four minutes, off for an hour. Sprinklers on for four minutes, off for an hour. Something like that. Um, the exact calculations you'll want to do based on the actual uh, sprinklers you install. But one of the rebates available to you are sprinkler upgrades. A uh, rotary sprinkler typically may be um, maybe $15 um, for a new head, um, but you, depending on the situation, you may get a rebate of $20 per head. So it could be hugely advantageous for you to consider um, in places where you are going to keep your sprinklers uh, upgrading the style that you've got. Pamela, can I interrupt for a sec? You bet. We had one one question I think we really ought to clarify. Um, Jose and yeah. Emma asked, is the half gallon per hour water absorption rate per what square footage? Um, it's a square foot. Like like one emitter, right? Any or any given right. point source? Right. Yeah, any given point source. Yeah. Okay. And so in general, we usually think about it as a one square foot. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. That is a good that that is a good thing to clarify there. <laughs> All right. So once we've thought generally about water conservation and some of those pieces of things, they might help you think differently about even, you know, what you do with what you already have. But then I'm going to talk a little bit about the inline drip basics. Now, inline drip was created, or this style of inline drip that I'm about to talk about, inline drip grid, um, it was created by a company called Netafim in Israel, another place where they have a lot of agriculture and not a lot of water, um, as an efficient way of doing things. Um, but uh, now, many of the major manufacturers like Rainbird, even Ewing, um, the Dig Corporation, there are many other um, participants that um, provide inline drip actual materials. Um, so um, it's not strictly one company, but what, what this is not, however, is a spaghetti head. And most of the time when people think about drip irrigation, this is what they're thinking of. That is a spaghetti head specifically meant for um, doing a sprinkler head conversion. So you've got a whole bunch of tubing off and you've got the little, the little uh, drip heads at the end and you've got one right at the base of every plant. Um, the spaghetti head um, has been around for a while They're in various forms, um, but uh, this is not what's considered efficient or uh, great for plants. This is another way of looking at the very same thing. This is, you know, another way of calling it just point to point drip. And here's a, a blank. Uh, the, the black tubing is blank. Um, you have little uh, sort of spaghetti pieces of quarter inch tubing that come right off and then put a dripper head right at the base of a plant. And this is totally what drip was when I was growing up and it was a new thing, but this is not what drip is about right now. And some of you might not be able to see the head. I realize there's not enough contrast, but that little triangle there is where the little dripper head is, right at the base of this plant. Now, this shrub has been here for a little while, and you know where his roots are? They're way out here in all directions. So this is not efficient, nor is it great for the plants because it's not putting water where the actual roots are. And this plant would be susceptible to say if the drip died, you have one dripper that dies, then your one plant doesn't get water. And if the rest of your system looks okay, you may not notice until it's much too late. So your plants are very, very stressed. Um, but it also has the potential, depending on the plant, to introduce disease um, by uh, keeping the, the actual like trunk of the shrub um, too wet, for example. Um, so 
this is definitely not it, but this is most of the time. And if you go search, Google searching for images for drip, this is more what you're going to find. This is what most of us might have in our yards now. This is what inline drip looks like. Here's one dripper. You can see the mechanism sort of in the tube. There's a little check valve that when there's pressure in the line, um, the, the little valve opens and the drip the emitter, I should say, I'm sorry, I just accidentally clicked the page. The emitter um, is putting out water at a rate, in this case, of 0.4 gallons per hour. So less than a half a gallon if you have the thing on in an hour. Um, and the way we put it together um, is to create a grid. Now, most frequently with our clay soil and our native plants and the way we like to plant a certain density of plants and everything, we're looking at 12 inch spacing between our drippers and 12 inch spacing between our tubing. And if you look at the emitter tubing that I have, this is a slight hill um, and uh, you can see the water has been on for a few minutes and so you can see the drip pattern um, in that space. Um, and what it might look like when it is completely bare. Here's a commercial application of the same thing. It's totally flat, straight for miles. You can see they've done a test before they put anything in the ground and the water is very evenly spaced. It looks like railroad tracks all the way down. Right? Here's a residential application. Again, on a slope, this is the other thing that's so great is that you can use inline drip and you can have more uh, topography in your yard, which is another way of creating interest um, uh, with low water, you know, shrub like plants um, by just adding a little bit of soil here and then creating some bumps. Um, what you see here is a partial planting, a planting that's sort of in progress, um, taking some existing planting that was staying and adding drip grid to this. And when you see the yellow lines, what you're seeing, what, I'm, what I'd like to point out here is that if this plant decides to grow some new roots when put in the ground, which of course it has, it can go in this direction and find water, in this direction and find water, in this direction and all the way around in a circle and find water wherever it goes, which means it will grow roots in all directions, which is also advantageous, not just when you're watering, but also when the rain falls, right? Your plants are creating um, a, an elaborate root system that will help them cope with drought conditions and less water um, even better by being sort of evenly spaced in all directions. I'm gonna talk about the parts now. Um, you do not need to be a plumber. You don't need to be an expert. And I don't expect that everybody here today is gonna to do this for themselves. What I do want you to have though is enough information to know that if you hire somebody to help you, that they actually know what they're doing and that you can make sure that you don't have any missteps when it comes to either the rebate or just making sure that you have the most efficient system for yourself. So let's start with the beginning of an inline drip grid, okay, the beginning. The first thing you're likely to have is some Schedule 40 propping up where your sprinkler head used to be. So one of the things I'm definitely going to say is reuse whatever you possibly can. Um, so most of the time there's a sprinkler head somewhere nearby where you'd like to be that you could just, as you're converting, um, utilize and it's already connected all the way back up to your controller. And so all you have to do is make some of those changes. You will need obviously a PVC pipe cutter and some primer and glue to get that part started, if that's what you're doing. Um, uh, but that's, uh, that's usually where we're gonna start. I'm, you're, you know, some, some people will not have what is necessary and you may need to do some trenching and all of that underground stuff would be with DVC. But um, if you've got something existing, see if you can make it work. Um, your life will be easier and uh, you can, and it's great to reuse what you've got. Um, so now I'm just gonna talk about some of the threaded pieces, some of the pieces that kind of go right here at the 
at the beginning of the system. And the first thing that you have is the pressure regulator and the filter. And in this case, they're all in one unit right here. Um, if you unscrew this, you'll get to the filter and I do have a picture of that. Um, most of the time, if you're using an existing sprinkler head, you're gonna have schedule 40 that's a half inch. Um, but if you're putting in something new or you have something less standard, um, you might have three quarter inch. So um, you'll have to tie these two things together. Um, however is appropriate, it might involve adapters. Um, but what you want is to reduce the pressure in the line to 30 to 40 PSI. 30 is by far the most common. Um, most of the time, if you were to look at the pressure available uh, in your, so you could do like a, um, a tester on your hose um, outside, you're gonna find that in the city of San Jose, um, you might have pressure of it 60, even 80 on a Sunday when not that many people are using water. So that kind of pressure is not something we compensated for with old drip, but it is actually a, a big factor in um, early wear and tear. Um, putting a lot more pressure in the tubing um, than it was prepared to handle. So um, we can get more even distribution of um, and consistent uh, em emitting drippers all the way down the length of a line by reducing uh, the pressure in that line. And so the pressure regulator and filter um, are basically, they're, they're non-negotiable. You've got to start with that. Um, the next thing that um, you might use or probably use, particularly if you have any hilliness in your property uh, or your zone, is a check valve. And um, that check valve is going to help prevent water from moving up and down the line excessively. I'm not going to bore you with the science there, but I, what I can tell you is that um, you turn the water on and pressure goes into the line and you turn the water off and the pressure uh, of the water itself is is relaxed. And um, in both of those states where there's a change, there's a potential for wear and tear on your equipment and a check valve is generally recommended as an additional piece um, to, and particularly if you are on, if you're incorporating any slopes at all um, in uh, reducing wear and tear. The next piece um, that you might want to consider is not actually a threaded piece um, most of the time. You might find this as a cut off. You might find it labeled other things. It nearly always looks the same regardless of who makes it. Um, but this is, again, most of the time you won't see this in the plans, but I'm going to suggest that you put it in. Um, the shut off you want to put in is the very last thing before your header because or with your header because you want to be able to maintain your system, go out, check it, turn things off. You might turn off a little bit here, a little bit there while you're working on something. And it means that you don't have to go all the way back to wherever your manifolds are to turn things on. Um, the shut off um, is a super cheap part and it's absolutely worth having just so you have the flexibility to both work on your system, test your system without having to um, go all over. And then the last piece is an air or vacuum relief valve. And this is actually just sort of like a threaded nut. It has to go into another connector piece. This, um, again, with the check valve, helps to deal with the pressure changes that occur when your water goes on, when your water goes off. Um, it is recommended that there, if there is any height difference in your um, drip grid, that you put this at the highest point in the line. Um, and this will help basically air escape through this device, which looks very much like the top of an old sport water bottle, um, air out of this instead of being forced out through the dripper holes, which can cause um, uh, you know, early wear and tear on the, the uh, emitters, okay? And then I want to just sort of explain a little bit because this just looks like a mystery black part and I kind of want you to know how this goes. When you take it off, when you unscrew this, you're gonna find this long filter here. And that filter is something you unscrew this. You wanna have this accessible wherever it is. You might put it um, you might put it at the manifold, but you want this accessible so that you can get at the screen and you can clean out the screen every three to six months. So thinking about every change of seasons is a great time to do it. Literally you take it out and you rinse it off in the sink and you put it back. Um, so you might put this um, right here 
attach your manifold, which is, makes it nice and easy to unscrew and get at the filter. Not everybody can do this, um, depending on the space that you have, depending on what's there. Um, at my son's preschool, when we decided that we were upgrading, um, we found that we had welded pipes, metal pipes, and there was no way we were touching what had been there since the 60s. It just seemed like opening a can of worms. So instead, we, this is a PVC stub up right here for, um, for the irrigation where it is. This, so this is the beginning. And so we cut the PVC, we added this to it. And then we put a little box around it. You can see the cap part is exposed. Um, we ended up putting a you know, box on it and a lid. And that means that when we go down there and we dig around the lid, as long as we dig through the lip of the box where this is partially submerged so that the kids wouldn't play with it, um, that this area will be air and not dirt. And it will be really easy to go and clean out that filter every three months. All right, and yes, uh, to the answer to the pressure, 30 PSI is the most common. And then let's talk about the rest. You have emitter tubing, by far the most common. What we're talking about here when we're talking about sand expired clay um, is 0.4 gallons per hour, although the difference between 0.4 and 0.6 is not significant. Just whatever you pick, please stick with it because you are going to need to know that for the math. Um, but typically, we are looking for 12 inch spacing of our tubing and uh, 12 inch holes um, in the tubing. You will only find 12 inch spacing, 18 inch spacing in the tubing, anyways. You won't find anything at, um, uh, at this size smaller than that. Now, I mentioned that Netafim created this, and then other, there are other makers of this. Um, Netafim's tubing is 17 millimeter. Rainbird's tubing of the same thing, as is Ewing's of the same thing, is a half an inch. It's not exactly the same, so um, things to be aware of. And then blank tubing. You can use PVC for your headers um, if you want to, but blank tubing is so much easier to work with. Um, and blank tubing is great to um, connect everything where you might not want to have water. So an example might even be a place that you make a change. Maybe you put a um, manzanita in your yard and for the first three or four years, it needs a, a moderate amount of water. But after that, manzanitas don't like any summer water. Like they really object to summer water and you could kill them by overwatering them. So you might then swap out the portion of drippers that you don't need anymore with blank tubing. So, um, Blank tubing will also help you get from a, a stub up somewhere to where you want to start a header or a zone if it's not exactly in the right place. Um, it's flexible, it's easy to work with. You will need landscape staples. You will need lots of six inch landscape staples. Um, what we found, um, some of the documentation says every seven to 10 feet, but we found every three to four, particularly on a slope was very important. Um, it kept the tubing, the distance, the spacing, um, the way we wanted it. Um, and it also meant if we went to rate um, back the mulch to take a peek at what was going on, that the tubing was still where we expected it to be. Um, and uh, so, You'll need a lot of those. I ordered several boxes of landscape staples for um, a couple hundred square feet. So um, then these connector parts, there are so many. You will have to decide what connector parts you need. There are so many available to you, but here's some really common ones, the cross, um, where you've got tubing going in two directions. Um, the T, uh, where you've got, you know, something, you know, spread out in two, you've got elbows. Um, maybe you don't want to use blank tubing and you want to use a sharper elbow so you can make a sharper turn and you can put your landscape staple right, oops, sorry, right there over the elbow and keep that corner spot in place if it's going around, particularly if it's going around something, a piece of sidewalk or something like that. Um, another popular connector, as I mentioned, the, um, uh, the air gap, there are, um, there are key barbed connections that um, also have a threaded piece and um, that's how you can add those things. And the last piece is a flush valve. In this particular case, this is called an auto flush valve. And there 
is plenty of documentation like the air relief gap that says, mm, or the check valve that says, eh, you, you don't really have to have it. Um, you don't really need it. Um, and that might be true, particularly if you're going to fuss with it all the time. But if you are wanting sort of a set it and almost forget it kind of system, um, and particularly considering we have hard water and stuff, this auto flush valve is a really great thing to have. It doesn't have to be right. It needs to be at the end of the line of your grid somewhere, but it doesn't have to be right there at the end of the line. You can use some blank tubing and move it off to a space where um, it's, um, it's a little more out of the way because it does stick up. It's about three inches wide or so. Um, and it's common to put it in a box or under a decorative pot, something like that, something that contains the spray that comes out of it. It's under a minute where the spray comes out of the little sort of hash holes around the side and a little bit out the side. And basically it, it flushes the line until a pressure uh, is achieved in the line and then it seals itself off. Um, and it's a great way to basically flush any sediment or anything that did actually get in your dripper line out every single time your system runs. So um, again, that's sort of all of the stuff that I'm mentioning here is all about keeping your maintenance low. If you set this up from the beginning, um, this is, this is gonna be more workable for you all the time. Now here's this in practice. Um, here's a stub up that was sort of a sprinkler stub up. And I apologize for the shading, but man, finding good pictures of this is really hard. Um, here's my check valve. Here's my PVC. It's got a little elbow. We cut it down to the ground. I've got my check valve here first. Um, in this particular case, all of my um, pressure regulators are back at the manifold um, across the yard. This is an elbow that's going to take me from threaded to barbed. Here's my shutoff right here. Come around the corner again. Um, and here's my, ooh, I keep doing that. Uh, here's the header. This is, um, this is in this case, uh, um, I don't need to use blank tubing, um, but I could use blank tubing. Um, right here in this spot. And then this space goes off every 12 inches over here. So um, there's a check valve in each, you know, drip hole as well. I was covering all my bases. I really want to ignore this system now that it's in. So if we just move on ahead from where it is, here's that spot right there. And here's how it goes out over a big old spot. And the spot gets wider as we go. So I've got a little T here and a little bend right here. If it wasn't such a soft bend, I might have used an elbow, but that's how I filled the extra space. Um, you can still see, for example, um, in the arrangement, how the water runs downhill a little bit more at the bottom of the slope versus the top. Um, but And then this piece right here is awfully close to the grass. Um, and in some of the design guides, they suggest keeping um, the tubing more than six inches away from the grass because and there tends to be so much overspray from the grass and you can't keep mulch right up next to it um, with the same depth. Um, so that the potential, a lot of extra water right there might just mean weeds and not uh, the plants that you intend. But this is sort of how it goes. So I planted this actual plant in the space. We're gonna talk about this guy too. And I, 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 want to, I wanna show you what happened in my yard with these two plants in less than a year. Okay, so here's the little grape in its little spot on the back of a hill. The drip is covered with five inches of mulch. This was it in August of last year. And this was it at the beginning of June. That's a Rogers red grape, a native grape. Here's my little desert willow planted again at the end of June with the drip grid that I just showed you. Now that you can see this a little bit closer, right here in this spot, you can see this is the high point. So this is where I have that air, vac oops, sorry, air vacuum release valve. And this, again, that's my desert willow tree in the beginning of June, so a little less than a year. The roots, if you look out, if I, you know, go, they're out in all directions, all the places that I have provided water the roots are already growing and this uh, I live in a, an area where I get a lot of wind because I'm really close to 280 where it's sunken down I get I mean like 35 miles an hour wind on a random afternoon is not uncommon and um, 
my trees are really building roots that are very they're they're very sturdy um, despite the wind um, in a short period of time. So this didn't even doesn't even need staking anymore. So when you're making your drip plan, and I say I just say you can make your own plan. Absolutely, this is not something you need to be a plumber or a gardener to do. Um, although there are people that you can hire if you want. Um, uh, but if you're thinking about your back of napkin plan uh, to submit, here's a couple things that you know you want to think about. If you are assuming 12-inch um, line spacing and an emitter every 12 inches, as I mentioned, the most common for California, then you can take the linear feed of your project to estimate the total length of tubing you need, plus about 5 to 10 percent, because occasionally you will make a cut that isn't exactly where you want it. So you make a, you have to make a cut where you're ending something that's really close to a dripper, and then you're going to have to cut that dripper off um, to set it to, to continue on somewhere else. Um, at roughly 350 feet, you will have to consider either another header or moving your stub to the center of two areas. Um, one of the things that inline drip um, is so great about, or you know, the, the promises that it makes, regardless of manufacturer, is that if you have the pressure set correctly and you follow the sort of best practices, then the amount of water that comes out of every hole will be the same. Now, where the water runs down a little bit more, where there's a slope, yeah, 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 those kinds of things. But you can be, you can count on the same amount of water being provided in every dripper space in your grid um, at roughly 350 feet. That's sort of like the limit for that half inch or 17 millimeter tubing, where um, a strong, uh, a strong header and uh, water out in more than one direction um, can help. Most of, the, most of the time in our backyards in San Jose, for example, um, that it doesn't even come up, it's not an issue. Um, but if you live, say, in the hills um, near Alum Rock or something, and you might have a large sloped yard that you're trying to plant or whatever, you might actually run against some of those length limits. Um, so just a consideration when you look at the design guides available for any of these manufacturers you will find a, a mention of approximately how many feet um, you need to consider um, making an adjustment and all of those come with graphics to explain to you what they mean um, that tubing is always going to run along your slope and never up and down which is why I sort of had a u-shape um, to the uh, round grid in my yard um, because that's sort of the way it slopes. Uh, I mentioned sort of keeping it um, a little more than six inches away from turf. Um, for sure, uh, we made an adjustment after we installed ours. We said, why? Why did they say that? Um, we noticed there was a lot of water there and it was a place where weeds were constantly coming from. I was constantly hand pulling weeds. And the whole point, right, for me, <laughs> Um, and so much of my gardening and mulching is to avoid weeding by hand. So um, we actually just came back and removed some of that tubing. Um, draw it out for a better estimate of the tubing and the connectors you need. Um, you will get more, you know, bang for your buck buying parts in bulk. Whether you're buying them locally or online, um, you will get more bang for your buck if you're buying. So if you know approximately how many T's and how many crosses you need and you order that and a little bit more, um, you'll be better off. They often come in bags of 25 um, and a bag of or individually buying one or two might be the same as a bag of 10 or 25. So um, sort of get a sense of what you need. Reuse as much as you can of your sprinkler stubs because that's going to reduce both the cost and the time to set things up. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. I will, uh, I haven't seen any questions pop up in the chat right now. Um, feel free if there's something about this particular, you know, set of slides. If you have a question about, it, go ahead and type it in uh, the chat. Even if I don't get to it right this second, um, I will go back and, and check. Um, you can also use drip air, inline drip irrigation to water your trees. And many of us, as we remove our lawns, will actually consciously have to think about watering the trees in our environment because they will no longer be getting all that extra free water from the grass. Um, so a, a trick or a tree ring irrigation contraption is not a thing you buy. It's simply what you do with this 
same set of tools that I have just described. So when you're watering trees, here's a tree, here's your canopy, where the crown is the tree, and here's the drip line. If you imagine where you know the rain is falling off the outer edges of your trees, that, that's the drip line. That's the widest part of the canopy. And that is where you want to apply most of the water for a tree. So now that you can think about that, um, these are the same parts. This is this trick is basically a hundred dollar design to water a tree that uh, that uh, UC Davis uh, came up with. Here's your filter and pressure regulator. Um, here's your little adapter, cement, here's your tubing, um, and here is an optional um, a hose water timer. Um, depending on the right situation. So remove this and this whole thing is actually only about $75. So here is it laid out. Um, just thinking about all the details, the spacing as you can see is one foot in between, it's 12 inch um, hole spacing. You can provide, um, this is just laid out so that you can think about it. But most of the time, if you have an established tree, you wouldn't have the drippers anywhere near this close to the pump. Um, but then they provide us a great little picture. This is probably not how you would see it. This is in grass, but this is so that the green grass versus mulch contrasts with the blue tubing so that you can see what it's looking like. Here is an established tree and here's the 100 feet of so dripping. I actually don't know if this particular thing is representing 100 feet, it doesn't look like it. But what you have here is sort of the, where it would connect to, um, the hose, etc., all the way around. Oh, sorry, giant circle. Um, where this would connect, and we're assuming, based on the size of the trunk, that this is roughly where the canopy or drip line of the tree is. If you provide most of the water there, um, so this is also what you can use even for very thirsty trees like stone fruit or almond. So here's a way of thinking about it. Um, a medium semi-dwarf peach tree in San Jose might require 16 gallons of water per day in July. So that's 112 gallons per week. If we water twice a week, now, of course, you can also just water once a week. That's okay, too. Um, if you're putting this kind of drip grid in, uh, you're not going to waste the water. Um, but if we water twice a week, that's 56 gallons we need to put down each time. Or if we had 100.4 gallons per hour drippers an hour and 16 minutes of irrigation each time. Do the math. If you were doing that just once a week, you would be watering two and a half hours. But what you have to think about is with that dripper, where the actual amount of water coming out for that first hour is less than half a gallon. It's, it's like a pint, right? <laughs> um, so it's a very small amount. It's not gonna run away from where the tree's drip line is. Um, and you know, you could you can also water things like an oak tree and you could water it once a month and you can give it a lot of water. This could be on for 24 hours, um, watering once a summer or something like that. I mean, the possibilities are endless depending on what kind of tree you have and what you are um, uh, what kind of water or situation or you know that you are trying to provide. Um, when I did this for my mom um, for her little fruit cocktail tree, um, we had a 250 foot roll of drippers. And what we actually did was just sort of run the tubing approximately where the drip line was, plus one, a circle one foot in and a circle one foot beyond um, that. And then we counted how many drippers that was based on the length. And it was 82 drippers. And then we figured out approximately how much water um, a stone fruit tree would need in San Jose in July with a canopy of roughly eight to 10 feet and did the calculations that way of how long it ought to be on. So this is adaptable to anything you might have going on in your yard. Um, okay, so then let's talk about scheduling. I don't want to scare you with the math. I really don't want to scare you with the math. <laughs> but we're going to come back to that woo cold and those classifications, okay? One of the things you want to do when you're looking at your existing plants or new plants you're hoping to put in and everything like that is think about hydro zones or a zone that contains only plants 
of one Wukul's classification together because math is hard and this makes your math easy. I'm not going to go into all the details right here in this moment about how to do this math. Some of you won't need it. Um, some of you don't want to hear about it. Um, some of you are really, really excited and you would rather see the source document um, with all of its 80 pages from uh, the UC system explaining this. But let me simplify by saying, if I have a zone, here's my zone A, it has a Wukul's low water for class classification. Here in San Jose, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, and it needs 2.2 inches of water replenished in the soil in July to address the amount of moisture that we lose to enviro transpiration, which is, you know, going up into going up into the air um, from our plants from the ground because of the heat. Um, this is, you know, this is what we're looking at. If I was to set up my drip grid and I watered one time, I'd say, I'd say it's just a grid of a thousand square feet. I'm just going to be even here. I could say I'm watering one time per week for 51 minutes. It's going to put 0.34 gallons um, where every emitter hole is for my 0.4 gallon per hour emitter in a 12 by 12 grid. And that will take care, that happening every week for the month will replace what those plants need to survive in July. Maybe thrive in July, but they will be able to survive in July. What Wukols gives us basically is a range where plants can survive and where they might thrive. What is potentially too much water, um, but also, you know, some of the plants you might have in your system and you might need to think about whether they get to stay. Uh, zone B is Wukols medium um, and it needs double the amount of water. Um, and so in this particular case for this zone, if I'm watering one time per week, I'm gonna need to water for an hour and 40 minutes. It's gonna put 0.68 gallons out of every emitter for my 0.4 gallon emitters. Now that might not see a whole lot and everything like that, but if I mentioned that I had a thousand square feet, to have something with a medium water classification for the month of July, it needs 2,600 plus gallons of water to survive. That may or may not sound like a lot to you, um, but um, that's part of the math. Um, it's definitely better than grass. I can tell you that. Even medium water is definitely less than what grass needs in the same time period. Um, but not necessarily the most efficient. And this, why, this is why low and very low are the classifications for reimbursement from the water district. So zone C in my imaginary garden is the Wukul's very low classification and it needs 0.2 inches replenished in July. Like I said, this is a really great plant. One time a week at five minutes with this drip grid system, would be sufficient for established plants. Now, very low water, I mean, all of our plants need two to three years to be established. And very low water plants tend to need a little bit more like low until they're established. But um, once you have gotten them established, three to four years down the line, very low classification, you might not actually need to water them at all um, in the summer. Um, if we have a mild summer or, you know, water them only once at five minutes, for example, if we have a couple days where it's 112, three days in a row, um, like it's been in British Columbia, um, because that is above average stress. The benefit, again, of having a shutoff in each one of your little zones is the ability to say, oh, I might need to run it for these certain plants, but I actually can turn this other zone off right here. Um, and all you got to do is move that little switch instead of um, rerouting a bunch of plumbing. So there's nothing wrong with having your uh, drip grid laying there underneath the mulch at the surface um, and just chilling for when you need it. Because um, obviously in the winter, if we don't have a dry winter, um, you'll be able to turn it off. It can just sit there. But for those very low water plants, you may not be able to have, you may not have to water them in the summer at all once they're established. I know I mentioned manzanita, but there's actually a whole category of plants that would be just fine. 
So then I have um, some tips. If you're going to do this yourself, um, not all the parts that I just mentioned are available locally, or they're not at least available um, in the exact sizes or by the manufacturer that you are looking for. Um, metric and imperial sizing, as I mentioned, is not interchangeable. That doesn't mean you go out and search perfectly so that you're always metric. It just means that sometimes you're going to need some adapters. Um, it is just part of the thing. You'll need some adapters. Um, and that you want to look at threading sizes to make sure that those match, or you need adapters for those, typically going from half inch to three quarters, things like that is happening a lot. Plumbing tape really helps. There's other ways of, um, you know, there's plumber's putty and things like that, but plumber's tape I find is the easiest to keep clean. Um, you know, it helps address leaks, but it's much easier to put on and keep clean when you already have gloves on your hands, for example. Um, no system is ever going to be perfectly free of leaks. It's just not going to happen. Um, so if you can relax about that detail, it's not necessarily wasting water. Here's a way of thinking about it. If you have a leak, for example, maybe where your header and your drippers come together, the header being, you know, how you spread out um, the one side of that grid to distribute the water for all the long tubes. Um, if you just if you think about maybe a drip in that spot, if the amount of water that comes out in that spot does not exceed what you're seeing come out of your drippers, then just mentally count it as an extra, you know, emitter and move on. Um, if it's a lot more than that, then yeah, you know, go and fix that. Um, but no system is going to be perfectly free of leaks. Um, Blank tubing, I found to be much easier to work with and more flexible, a header than PVC. Um, it's easier to cut, there's no priming or gluing, um, so it's easier from that setup. But um, it's also easier, or it's also less likely to break. I mean, Schedule 40 is nice and sturdy, but still, if you stood on a bunch of PVC or put something heavy down on it hard, it could still crack and break, and that's kind of a pain in the butt to replace. And Blank tubing can be stepped on and it will just sort of bend a little bit and pop back. So um, you can put um, inline drip grids in a sidewalk strip um, and people get out of their cars and step on it all the time. As long as you're not stepping directly on the tubing, you've got the mulch there or something, you're good to go. Um, it's still gonna last for you. And all those barbed tubings, when you put all that, so all those pieces together, um, it's, um, it can be hard on your hands. Um, and so we tried a couple experiments to see some sort of ways to put that together to make it easier. And what we found is that if you pulled your tubing out of your garage while you were working on it and left it for a few minutes in the sun, it would sort of you know, get softer and there was no harm in doing that. Um, so what we noticed is we pulled the tubing out an hour before we wanted to get started. In that morning sun, it was it was already more flexible and easier to do um, things with. Um, we also noticed that we could take a sort of a, a thermos container with some hot water and we can dip the portion that we're trying to push the barbs in into the hot water. Um, but we also try to heat gun. And I'm going to tell you, don't try anything hotter than a little bit of hot water. Don't do it. Um, anything except that is really going to make the tubing, it makes the tubing ever so slightly brittle. And the connector will go on and you will think everything is groovy. And then a couple months later, that's where things pop off. So um, don't do that. <laughs> um, take it from me. The only repairs that we had to do to the system were where we tried like the heat gun method to, to put things on. Um, you want to plan where you put that auto flush valve. Um, if you, you know, you might want to contain its spray. We did a number of things. We took like a, um, um, we took a, a, an eight by eight like drainage thing, and we put two zones and ran that were away on the away from each other. And as they came towards each other, we took the um, that off flush valve that goes at the end, we stuck the ends of them into an eight by eight box. So the water sprays into the box. It's not wasted. It's going in the vicinity of the plants in that area, but um, it doesn't spray and blow mulch anywhere um, when it goes on. Um, and that's really helpful. Um, 
another we in another place where we discovered um we were too close to the fence and it kept hitting the fence and we didn't like that um we put a little a long drain near the fence and that just meant that um that was also beneficial because if it turns out it rains in that area there's not a place a lot of place for rain to run off um and another place we had um a piece of terracotta that I think is sort of like the insert into um, a chimney and we use it as a basically as a pot um, but we just plopped it on top of them and so they spray into it and you know there's a there's a, a potted plant on top of the thing um, but um, if you don't have a spot where you can put that auto flush valve like near where your line your grid ends you can take a whole bunch of dripper um, or blank tubing and run it to a place that's like eight, 10, 12 feet away or something like that, someplace that's more convenient for you. Um, but the auto flush valve will um, will be appreciated when you don't have to clean stuff out of the line. Um, the other thing is when you look at the documentation for uh, the design grid for Netafim right now for, um, um, uh, for Rainbird, etc., you're going to see a lot of reference to, to subsurface. Um, that's like the new thing. Um, but the experienced people who've been doing inline drip um, for a while um, and who've been taught, who have sort of come up with the the state guidelines for certifications for landscape professionals that want to put this in and and have those certifications. Their, their expert opinion is that surface Surface application plus the mulch lets you observe, lets you figure out what's going on. You do not want to have to dig up your plants to dig up your tubing and figure out what might be going on um, if something doesn't appear to be right. So um, that combination is sort of the best of both worlds. Easy access, easy observation, um, easy changes. If you have a more mature plant and you need to change it, or for example, say you have a small tree and you've got like, you know, the, the drip line covered, but then the tree is really much bigger a couple years later and you start thinking, you know what, um, I'm gonna need more tubing to get to the drip line. And so you pull your mulch back and you add some tubing and you pull it all out. You couldn't do that if that was underground. You wouldn't be able to make those kinds of adjustments. Um, and then you wanna pull back that mulch and inspect the soil, like look at it and say, is this the soil moisture that I was expecting at this time? Um, and if not, then you have the option to investigate that. And if it was underground, you would have to run it a really, really, really long time to get sort of the wet spot indicators that would be probably the only indicators you would have um, before totally digging it up to figure out what might be going on. So, um, and the digging could hurt the roots. It's just a whole lot of work. Okay, so um, questions, and I see that there are a couple. Um, so, um, just... there are quite a few. Do you want me to mo moderate the questions and yeah, feed them to you? you? That, why don't you do that for me? Yeah, yeah. That, that way you won't have to look at it. Um, yeah. So, there was the question, I think, at the very beginning, but let's reiterate Is inline drip of this kind required for landscape conversion rebates? Yes. Okay. Not just for valley water, as far as I can tell, the ones that are done by the state for places where their water district does not have their own rebate also requires it. Okay, that's clear. Um, how can this type of drip system be used for containers? And someone else asked about containers too. So can you oh, talk yeah. about containers? So um, when you're talking about container gardening, you are talking about something that is above ground. You're talking about potentially a different soil type, right? Because you put potting mix in that thing. Um, so things might be a little different. And small containers, sort of the, um, the, the downside too, is that um, if you were to do loops, for example, of the 17 millimeter tubing, that would take a lot of surface area um, inside some smaller pots. So um, there is a, quarter inch version of this inline drip tubing. It does not usually have the check valve and some of the other features that the full size tubing has, but it's very, the quarter inch can be bent into um, loops 
Um, for example, that's what I, I have. Um, our preschool has a bunch of um, wine barrels. And so we have two loops of quarter inch tubing in there. And the way we went from the larger tubing to the quarter inch tubing, we basically had the, the quarter inch tubing that comes off um, the big line, sort of like the picture that I had way back when I said point to point drip was not it. Um, but we, you know, the, we had a combination of plants on the ground and these pots. And so what we did was we don't cut a hole or, you know, stick a hole in the actual 17 millimeter line um, or half inch line. We put a connector um, with a threaded P connector. And then we put um, one of the heads. And in our case, like Rainbird were the only ones that we could get, but they were available at Home Depot. And it was basically a threaded connector that came out like the old um, point to point drips with like two little screw caps and little quarter inch strippers. And you can put the quarter inch line off of those um, and put it in a loop around your pot. You can continue the loop on if you had a whole bunch of containers in rows, you could simply just move it on down the line. Um, or you can end that um, with and half gallon per hour, make sure you read that part. Colors are not a good indicator because every manufacturer is a different color, but a half gallon per hour or less um, dripper head at the end um, is a good way to end it. The quarter inch line has a firm limit of 17 feet. You cannot use more than 17 feet in one um, length. So most of the time, if you have, if you have containers, um, and you know, in, in uh, like say you're trying to water a pot near your, you know, other, if you just have it coming off for that pot or a couple pots in the system, um, it's 10 feet total maybe, you know, you're groovy, you can just tie them together, um, but you are going to want to have a different, you want to have the a, um, tubing coming off on the other side or a different spot for another place down the line. Uh, don't connect blank tubing, you can't, you can, like I said, you can do 350 feet before you start worrying, 350 feet total in a grid before or the longest length in, a, in, um, in your arrangement where you have to worry about um, pressure loss in the larger tubing. But 17 feet is like a firm limit for the little stuff. So, um, but that is how you can put the two of them together. Okay, containers. So it's, you don't just punch a hole in the brown tubing. No, you don't want to punch a hole in the brown tubing because then you might have to, you know, replace the whole tubing altogether. And in fact, in many places, there's like a, there's actually like a unit. There's like a copper tube and the, uh, a piece of plastic that slides open for this check valve for that to open for most of the tubing. So um, you wouldn't want to mess with that. I would go with connectors because you can always, this is so great. Here's my, here's my little unofficial pro tip you can take bonsai pruners they're like super sharp and pointy and small and you can go um if you have say your your two your um your tubing is here and your barbed connector is here you can kind of take the pruners and like snip off a little bit rather than try to pull because it's not supposed to be able to come off right with this barb you can cut it back until it comes off and you can put a different connector on so that you can um make changes ideally your tubing is going to last you 10 plus years a punch hole is not going to be a reliable dripper for a year let alone 10. okay um along the lines what about repairs um perhaps uh, animal bites a hole in the line or one of the drips becomes clogged how do you take out a chunk and put a new chunk in yeah so i mentioned you know how you can um cut the little section off where it's barbed to make us a, a chain. Um, we had to do this, it wasn't exactly a repair, but we had underestimated how much water um, one of our grasses needed. Um, it was too much reflected heat. Um, and so we needed to make an adjustment. And so we had one row of tubing and one row of blank because we were worried about drowning them. And we had to turn around and take that blank off. So we cut the two connectors where the blank was on either side. Um, and swapped it out with drip tubing like that. Um, so you can make repairs to tubing just like that. Um, the old black, you know, thin tubing, it was real easy for squirrels to chew it. 
but it was also really easy for us to forget that it needed to be covered. So we don't usually see um, wild animals interfering with inline drip that is properly under five to six inches of mulch. Keep your mulch deep um, and the animals won't even know it's there. <laughs> Um, so that's um, that's for sure helpful. Where the check valve and the um, air relief valve and the auto flush come in handy is that it really means that you hopefully are not doing a lot of maintenance. Um, we pull back the mulch to make sure that we don't stab with a shovel when we put a new plant in or something like that. Um, but the grid is already there. And so unless we do something dumb, um, you know, it, it should it should be lasting. Um, it should be lasting, but um, if you need to do repairs, um, it's not terribly complicated as long as you, you with the barbed connectors. Um, it's pretty easy to um, it's pretty easy to make those changes. The auto flush valve. Um, <laughs> I'm finding a lot of documentation that's like, oh yeah, you don't have to do that. You could just put a manual shut off at the end and manually open it. And that, that is absolutely true. And the flush valve is like $10 for that one unit, but it means it's flushing all the debris that might have acquired, been acquired in the line every single time you run it. So that might be once a week or twice a week, flushing every single time. How often are you going to remember to go out there and manually flush it? Yeah, that flush sounds like a really great idea. Yeah, it's just, it's so helpful. And the manual flush, I mean, it's better than nothing for sure, um, but um, the manual flush, you still are gonna have to do something. It's gonna be really close to the ground. You're gonna have to do something because when that water comes out, when you manually flush it, the water comes out with a lot of pressure instead of sort of pressure in all directions. Like when you put your hand over the top of a hose that's on, it's gonna go straight out. You're gonna have to have a bucket or something, or you might be washing your mulch or something away. Um, but you also have to remember to do it. And if you are doing it manually, they say something like once a month. Okay. Whether or not you're using it. Yeah. You okay, we've got a bunch of questions. Let's, mm -hmm. Should we go on some more? Mm -hmm. um, on the trees, how many emitters per tree? One of the questions says. Depends on the tree, right? Yeah, it totally depends on the tree. It depends on the tree. Um, it depends on... Uh, what's under and around the tree. If you are putting in a drip grid um, that's like in the vicinity of some established tree, one of the things you'll have to think about when you decide how much you water um, is that the tree might be taking some of the water already from the plant. So you can do a tree, on, a tree ring on top of it, particularly if you'd like to water the tree and not necessarily the plant layer. Um, but it really matters more than anything else, what size is the tree? What is the drip line of the tree? If you have a tree with a 30 foot canopy, you're gonna need to make many 30 foot circles in an ideal world to water that tree. If you have, you know, a tiny little crepe myrtle that has, you know, a 10 foot um, canopy, um, then that's gonna be totally different. Typically, the reason why there's, there's information, and this will be in the handout, um, the trick is not just the parts, but like how to calculate how much water use um, is because it's better to determine, take your tubing and put it around the drip line of the tree or measure the canopy of your tree and start estimating it from that. It's better to do that and then to say, okay, I have this many feet of tubing. Now, since I know I have one every 12 feet, I have this many drippers. And now to apply the amount of water that I want to do with the amount of drippers I ended up with. Here's the calculation. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Um, how close to the trunk can you place the emitters? That was one of the questions. So for a small tree that just came out of the little five gallon pot, it might be within a foot, right? But as soon as it gets bigger, you wanna move it to two or three feet um, and in general no more than three feet away from the trunk is good or no no closer than no closer than three feet no closer than no. farther is just fine if you've got a tree with a 30 foot canopy it doesn't want to be watered probably within six or eight feet of the trunk great um pamela you were talking about the next door conversation can you explain oh, that yeah. to folks because i think yeah. there's a lot of people who are asking I'd like to ask her about my specific landscape plan. <laughs> so. Yeah, 
So, okay, so this is my great idea, and I hope that some of you are on Nextdoor. Um, so I, the handout is not available yet because I actually wanted to put all of this on it um, once I set it up. But what, besides the Master Gardener Help Desk, and there are other Master Gardeners who are knowledgeable about inline drip, and feel free to use the Help Desk. Um, I am going to start a thread on Nextdoor if you are already on that application. You're used to probably just talking to your neighbors, but we actually have a gardening group that can be seen by basically the whole South Bay. Um, you will know you're in the right place um, when you see a little lime green chair in the top picture. But I'm actually gonna send you an invite so you don't have to go look for it. I'll put it in the, um, in the handout um, with a link so that you can find the gardening group. And I was intending to start like a master thread that we could have a converse, ongoing conversation about um, pursuing the rebates and the planning and um, tricks and, and how to do those calculations above and beyond what I put in the handout because I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of questions about it. Do you think I can post that link that you sent to me in the chat? Would that work yes. for everybody? Oh, no, yes, absolutely. You could do that right now. Absolutely. Let me do that. Okay. Okay. Um, hang on a second. Okay. I am posting link to next door here. So that link also should take people to that group. Excellent. So for people who would like to talk to Pamela about specific landscape plans or more about the Valley Water rebate program, that next door group would be a really great place because then you can do some back and forth. Right. Um, I, a couple questions. I, you know, the, um, I, the, uh, that I was seeing um, the question from Elaine about what do you do when you don't have a whole lot of exposed area to put that drip down? You know, that is just, that's a real tricky one. Um, as I look at converting more of my yard, um, I have a Japanese maple. That's a medium water tree. Um, it's a mature tree. It's very important to the shade in my dining room area. So it gets to stay. Um, but as I reduce the amount of watering that it's been getting through sprinklers, um, that's totally on my mind. Um, and so my, I can, the, um, you can do a combination of the two things. You can put some drippers where you do have space, where it is not concreted, for example. You can also, if you had a grid in the general vicinity, you could basically, fudge and say, okay, the plants need this much, but I'm going to provide an additional, you know, gallon per or two per month for each dripper um, to accommodate what the tree is also going to need. For sure, it's on everybody's mind um, as that we take out the lawn, there, um, that change, if we're super conservative right off the bat, it can be sort of a, sh a shock to a tree that's been receiving a lot of water from elsewhere. Um, but there's definitely not a perfect answer to that one. <laughs> um, and there are no rebates. Um, I, I mentioned the the sort of the push towards um, subsurface um, drip, and you can do that with a lawn installation. There are absolutely no rebates to do that. And that's sort of uncharted territory, but the point is that in general, where some of these other plants, like I mentioned, the low water plants need 2.2 inches per month. Um, lawn needs more like nine inches per week. So there's just, there's no, there will be no rebate accounting for, um, for that option. How about if you change your plant selection before the, after the, approval but um as long as the plants have the same watering requirements and can you can you change your plants yes yes you can um some realistic questions that came up for me many of these low water and uh, uh very low water plants are california native um well we're all interested in gardening right now and um it can be really tough to get uh your native plants except in like in the fall um so 
Um, Valley Waters requirement, and this is different from the state. I think the state's requirement says whatever lawn you have to take out if you're getting a rebate, you have to put, um, you have to plant 25% of that area. Valley Waters rebate for lawn conversion says you must plant 50% of the space. So if you choose uh, plants and Valley Water calculation sort of gives you their estimate for how many square foot for mature plant for one of those plants on the list. So if that plant says that you want to replace um, and it is four square feet towards your 50% total, then whatever you swap it out with would need to be four square feet or, or bigger. Um, and that totally brings me to another question that I just wanted to answer to very recently. Why are there not more trees on that list? Um, and that's because trees have this canopy and that's great and all that, but like, it, it, it by itself is not gonna cover the 50% requirement. So you could count a small tree um, because it would be great if you put more trees in your yard because that would provide more shade and less stress for all of your low water plants, um, but that the canopy doesn't count towards the 50% total. So feel free to put trees in your plan um, as long as they sort of meet that uh, low requirement, and there are a lot out there, but um, they don't count towards the square foot um, recommendations either. Um, I see someone has added a question about raised beds. Raised beds, yes. Um, I did this very same thing with the raised beds. Um, so I did a raised, in this case, a veggie bed, now water conservation versus the water even application was not, you know, that that was more my priority, but um, so I did the, and I needed it to be closer together for smaller basil plants, but I did the um, five zones where I basically interrupted the 17 millimeter tubing with a threaded T and um, put in quarter inch dripper for five zones in a bed that was a total of three cubic yards in volume. Um, so the zones were set up so that they all had their own shutoff, and so only where water plants were planted would um, would water go. And um, you can absolutely do that. Um, you can also do if you're doing um, uh, you know sort of uh, ornamental plants in raised beds or something. It's, it's, or you just want to be more efficient and you don't want to hand water. You can put um, this tubing in a grid in a raised bed. Um, and water tomatoes this way. Um, the, the tricky part, of course, is that you're going to have to sort of eyeball and continue to fudge to figure out how much time because tomatoes definitely are not on the Wukos list. Um, and um, and many people don't put enough mulch to really cover tubing, and the tubing exposed to the sun like that over a summer in a veggie garden isn't um, is not necessarily going to last very long. Um, the rough estimate from using this in commercial applications in like Sacramento Valley, um, where they have no intention of covering it, is that four to five years before it all has to be replaced. So it, it could be more or less for individuals, but there's not a whole lot of data to go on besides that commercial. Okay. But well, you I can use it. I think that's all of our questions. Um, awesome. This has been really terrific. Ross, would you like to say anything to the library patrons before we sign off? No, uh, just thank you for joining us. Uh, great to see so many questions coming in, even right from the very start. And thank you to Pamela for a very informative talk. Hopefully some people will get to put it to use. <laughs>